I'm Steve Liebman. In 1991, two murders make headlines, but their circumstances couldn't be more different. In one, the male victim is known around the world, and his death is mourned by millions. In the other case, police are at first unable to identify the victim, let alone the killer. But first on Crime Investigation Australia, a bizarre extortion attempt goes terribly wrong, and one of the world's great healers is shot dead in the street. In the late 80s, Asian crime gangs are establishing a foothold in Australia's major cities. So, a special task force is set up to target organised Asian crime, win the confidence of the local community, and break down the culture of fear and intimidation. But within months of the task force being established, a senseless and shocking crime is committed. The ruthlessness and brutality of Asian gangs becomes all too apparent when a famous Chinese Australian known and loved around the world is gunned down in the street. The year is 1991. The notorious Asian-based criminal networks known as the Triads are spreading terror throughout Asian Australian communities. The Triad thugs show no mercy. Their stock in trade is extortion, robbery, torture and murder. Police, unfamiliar with the secretive nature of some Asian cultures, are making little headway. Detective Inspector Jim Council from the New South Wales Police Force is assigned to target Asian crime gangs. They have very scant uh, regard for the law and uh, because of their uh, perhaps uh, or uh, their attitude towards law enforcement and perhaps the lack of uh, our knowledge at that time by the New South Wales Police, uh, they were able to be a little more successful than perhaps they are today. On the 8th of March of that year, uh, we formed uh, Task Force Oak. Now that was to investigate uh, organised Asian crime such as uh, uh, intimidation, prostitution, extortion. Detective Sergeant Ron Smith is a senior member of the Task Force Oak team. And the idea was to, uh, to f form close liaisons with the Asian community and uh, get their trust, the community's trust, and uh, to uh, carry out uh, in-depth investigations into this uh, whole uh, aspect of uh, crime within uh, New South Wales. But it wasn't confined to Sydney, it was also Melbourne. Melbourne had their own Asian task force down there, and uh, so did other states were uh, raising concerns so far as uh, that type of crime was concerned. This is Sydney St Vincent's Hospital, a world leader in cardiothoracic surgery, including life-saving heart transplants. Here, hundreds of patients are treated by the remarkable Chinese-Australian surgeon, Dr Victor Chang. Born in Shanghai, China, Victor Chang makes up his mind to be a doctor after his beloved mother dies of cancer when he is just 12. At 15, Victor is sent to the Christian Brothers School at Lewisham in the inner western suburbs of Sydney. He's a gifted student. He goes on to the University of New South Wales and graduates as a Bachelor of Surgery. In 1972, he joins the cardiac unit at St Vincent's Hospital where he refines the art of heart surgery and works tirelessly to develop artificial heart valves and other life-saving technology. Patients find his cheerful, no-nonsense manner encouraging. They call him by his first name and think of him as a friend. He's also a great ambassador for Australia. He travels extensively throughout Southeast Asia and China, sharing his knowledge with medical professionals in the region. In 1984, Dr Chang establishes the first National Heart Transplant Unit at St Vincent's. 
It's later in 1984 that Victor Chang takes on a case that will catapult him into the international spotlight. A 14-year-old schoolgirl, Fiona Coote, is gravely ill with heart disease. Fiona is close to death as Victor Chang and the St. Vincent's transplant team go to work. The operation is a complete success. Fiona Coote's life is saved and Dr. Chang becomes world news. Over the next few years, people from all walks of life benefit from Victor Chang's skill and dedication. By 1991, his National Heart Transplant Unit is responsible for almost 200 heart transplants and 14 heart-lung transplants. Dr. Chang lives here in the beautiful harbourside suburb of Klontarf. He's a creature of habit. He leaves home every morning at the same time for work and he always travels along the same route. On the morning of July 4th, 1991, he gets into his car at the usual time and drives across the picturesque Spit Bridge. Traffic's heavy, but it's flowing smoothly as he wends his way up the steep hill that will take him through Mossman. He calls his wife from his car phone as he turns from Spit Road into Military Road, heading towards his city office. Unbeknownst to Dr. Chang, he's being stalked by two men in a Toyota sedan. Are you cheating water? As he drives along Military Road in the right lane, he feels a bump and hears the sound of crashing metal as his car is struck on the front left-hand side by another vehicle. He turns into the next side street, Lang Road, and parks his car. The two men in the other vehicle follow Dr. Chang into Lang Road, and then they approach him. A long argument ensues. The men argue in Mandarin Chinese for several minutes. A passerby then hears Dr. Chang shout out in English, call the police, they have guns. A shot rings out and Dr. Chang falls to the ground. Then another. Victor Chang, the king of hearts, the miracle worker, is dead. Australia is horrified by the murder of Dr. Victor Chang. Grief is mixed with disbelief and outrage that such a great man could be so cruelly and senselessly cut down. Former New South Wales Premier Neville Rann is close to Victor Chang and is devastated by news of his murder. I'm more than devastated. I was absolutely thunderstruck. I could not believe that a genius of his quality could be struck down by a couple of gangsters in the streets of Sydney. It uh, lived with me for more than months, for years afterwards. Detective Sergeant Dennis O'Toole who's played a key role in solving the so-called granny murders just months earlier, is also called into the crime scene. I don't think I was prepared for uh, the actual scene when I got there, and uh, I suppose it's something that it shocked most people with uh, Dr Chang. He was such a prominent, well-known person in the community. Um, even people that didn't know him personally, I think, uh, were just outraged and shocked uh, that something like this could happen to uh, such a high-profile person. The assistance of the scientific was sought, of course, and uh, they're, they're always uh, have priority as far as uh, investigating the initial stages of a crime scene. And uh, we uh, began to collect uh, evidence and uh, interview witnesses. There were a number of witnesses. In fact, that there was a, a gentleman walking to work past the scene at the time of the shooting and he had been threatened by the, offend the offender with the firearm. When the murderer points his gun at him, the passerby puts his hands in the air and says, it's got nothing to do with me, and then flees to safety. It's a miracle that he escapes with his life. He and other witnesses describe Dr. Chang's assailants as being of Asian appearance. Detective Sergeant Ron Smith of Task Force Oak is monitoring police radio as a normal part of his duties. I spoke to Jim uh, 
Council and uh, as a result of that I led a team of uh, investigators to uh, Mossman, to the location uh, where um, we found that uh, Dr Victor Chang had in fact been uh, shot dead uh, during an incident there at uh, Mossman and uh, uh, an aborted uh, robbery attempt um, by two uh, Asian males, persons described as being Asian males, who had uh, subsequently fled the scene. Almost immediately, a vital clue is discovered. The crime scene had been left intact, and uh, one of the objects that were located, or was located at the crime scene, uh, was a wallet. And that wallet contained uh, airline tickets, and a, an identification certificate, a Malaysian identification certificate, which uh, I believe is about 20 years old at that stage. However, it certainly did identify a person. Uh, that wallet was something that uh, caused quite a bit of um, concern, as it were, uh, bearing in mind that uh, it's not often that you get th that type of evidence left at a crime scene and we were faced with the, a number of scenarios, the possibility of it being a setup, uh, the possibility of a red herring, and of course the possibility that it was genuine and that person was involved somehow uh, in this matter. Detective Inspector Mike Hagan is a senior investigator based at Chatswood Police Station. The finding of the wallet as a, as a piece of, of uh, forensic evidence at, at a crime scene was, was most outstanding. Uh, from this point of view that, that it's quite unique that a person who commits a crime would actually drop or, or leave their wallet at a crime scene, but it happened in this case. The murder falls within the jurisdiction of the regional crime squad north based in Chatswood. But because the victim was of Asian background and because our initial evidence from eyewitness were that the two offenders were of similar Asian appearance, at that stage Task Force Oak was well established and uh, had been very highly successful in a lot of Asian crime investigation. A decision was made, and it was a very good decision, was made to combine Task Force Oak with the Region Crime Squad at Chatsward, Chatswood to make a combined force of investigators. And at the end of the day, that proved out to be worthwhile. Within hours, news of Dr Chang's murder is out and the men of Task Force Oak are facing a media frenzy that's threatening to run out of control. Dennis O'Toole has by now been assigned to the task force. There were some outlandish allegations made in the press where Dr Chang was involved in the illegal uh, taking of body parts, that he was tied up with the triads, that he was part of the movement in China that was going for democracy against the Chinese government and the Chinese government had planned to kill him. There were all these crazy schemes that the media, where they came from, uh, we don't know to this day, but all these theories were put forward and of course a lot of that still has to be acted on and you have to act on that information wherever it did come from. Uh, I won't say it was, wasn't without its uh, hiccups here and there but certainly uh, there was certain rules that were established with the media and, uh, and in the main it was a fairly amicable relationship during the investigation but it was certainly a lot of pressure on the investigators at all times uh, so far as the media was concerned. Dr Chang's funeral is held on a grey sombre day. Ordinary Sydney siders, even though they've never met him, arrive to pay their respects feeling a profound sense of grief and loss. The funeral of Dr Chang was held at uh, St Mary's Cathedral. It uh, was a very dismal day, it was a very bleak day, it was raining. A terrible tragedy, That uh, something that I think the people of Sydney showed their respect and their feelings for Dr Chang with the number of people that turned out for him at that funeral. But mixed with public grief is a burning desire for justice to be done. Task Force Oak has a monumental job to track down the killers and the wallet found at the scene of the crime will produce vital clues. So we um, systematically went through the wallet. Um, we uh, scientifically examined all the pieces of paper. Uh, it was all forensically examined. We photocopied it and from that we started commencing inquiries 
on all the addresses. And in that wallet, there was numerous names, numerous telephone numbers, numerous addresses of contacts in Melbourne, all relating to Melbourne. When the owner of the wallet is identified, it seems incredible that he's ever been allowed to enter Australia. The person of interest in Melbourne uh, was identified uh, initially by the police in Melbourne as being a, a person who did have a criminal record, not in this country, but had recently arrived from Malaysia. He had been here earlier in Australia, but had only recently, uh, some weeks earlier, arrived in Australia. The suspect under surveillance is Chu Seng Lu, a Malaysian national. He's traced to a location at Sunbury, on the outskirts of Melbourne. Once it was established uh, that uh, they had uh, Lu under surveillance down there, um, I travelled with uh, Paul Tuxford to Melbourne and uh, later joined, was later joined by uh, Detective Inspector Mike Hagan and we linked up with the Melbourne uh, uh, team, the homicide squad down there. Our big fear, obviously, with, with Lou was that if we'd approached him too early, his answer or his defence might have been, oh, well, I lost my wallet in Sydney. Thanks, for, thanks very much for finding my wallet. Where did you find it? I lost it in Melbourne. Oh, you found it in Sydney. And that would have been his stock answer, we believe, which would have left us fishing. Um, and so we were very, very careful not to approach him until we had sufficient evidence to, uh, to interview him and subsequently charge him. Lou is seen by the police surveillance team in meetings with a number of people. But one particular meeting is of special interest to investigators. It's a meeting between Lou and an as yet unidentified man. Well, there was a meeting in particular where they met in Melbourne, from recollection was on a bus seat or a railway station, and uh, the uh, surveillance team said that they were in very uh, deep and uh, uh, conversation, and in fact, uh, uh, Lou had uh, displayed some sort of alarm at the in his expressions and during the conversations. It was obviously not just a meeting about a, having a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or a beer. It was, uh, it was apparent that they were, it was a fairly serious sort of conversation. So. With Dennis O'Toole's team assigned the task of identifying the second suspect, Ron Smith and Mike Hagan prepare to move in on Chu Seng Lu. On the 13th of uh, July, uh, Lu was seen to be dropped in a vehicle at a, uh, a travel agency in, uh, in Melbourne. And uh, then sub subsequently joined a, um, a, a bus, an airport bus, which uh, the uh, <coughs> surveillance teams had under surveillance. And which of course, this time uh, sent alarm bells ringing, although we had the uh, the airport's covered and that um, was still concerned that uh, he may somehow slip the net. So we followed him. It was quite an interesting morning. We, uh, two or three police cars with uh, detectives on board, we headed out um, and it was peak hour traffic on a Saturday morning in the middle of Melbourne, so there was traffic everywhere. I'll never forget that morning because one of the easiest routes for us to follow was to follow the tram tracks up the middle of Melbourne, which we did. Uh, missing a few trams here and there on the way. But we finally followed the airport bus out to Tullamarine Airport. And just as uh, Lou arrived in the bus at Tullamarine, so did we arrive. And we uh, alighted from the police cars, we surrounded the airport bus. There was other passengers on board, so we had to be very, very careful and professional that uh, we didn't end up into some type of uh, siege situation where we had a uh, suspect for murder trying to arrest someone in a public place. It's always a problem when you're doing that. This was about one o'clock on a Saturday at Tullamarine Airport, so there were, there were people everywhere. And uh, so we had to be very careful. And so it was all done quietly and professionally, but we surrounded the bus. And uh, we allowed for the passengers to get out, and we watched all the passengers get out the front door. Um, the driver got out and allowed people to get their their bags out of the bus and then we saw Lou. He was about midway in the passengers alighting from the from the bus 
and he walked down to the back of the bus to pick up his bag and that's where he was grabbed. And there was an absolute look of surprise on his face. Uh, the fact that uh, it was so close for him. Another uh, 20 or 30 metres and he would have been inside Tullamarine Airport and he may have been past the state line, gone into the federal area and uh, been on board a plane. Lou is interviewed at the investigation complex in St Kilda. Lou uh, made no admissions uh, to the offence, uh, which was something we always thought may occur. Was He stated that he'd lost his wallet shortly after his arrival in, uh, in uh, Australia back in January of that year. We took him through each item that was contained in the wallet and um, he agreed that um, these items were his were his and uh, included in the wallet was a, um, a lottery ticket or a lotto ticket uh, which had been purchased in Melbourne uh, in June of that year. How he had originally said that he lost his wallet back in February that year. Uh, now when, when shown the, uh, the lotto ticket he uh, agreed that it was his lotto ticket and they were his numbers on the lotto ticket so uh, he didn't pick up at that stage what he'd actually said, but it became a significant part of our brief so far as uh, uh, blowing out his uh, story of the wallet having been stolen, so we knew we were on the right track. Chu Seng Lu is charged with Dr Victor Chang's murder, but the second suspect, yet to be identified by name, will be harder to track down. In fact, he's already slipped out of Australia. Malaysian criminal Chu Seng Lu has been arrested for the murder of Dr. Victor Chang. Now he has to be discreetly and safely returned to Sydney to face charges. But public and media interest is so intense that the trip has to be carefully planned. On the Thursday morning at about 3am 3, 3 in the morning, our team went to the city watch house and uh, we took possession of Lu. He was placed in our cars and we drove him uh, from Melbourne back to Sydney. It took about uh, 10 to 12 hours, but it was a very secure, it was a safe trip. And um, as far as I'm aware, uh, to this day, the media were not aware of us leaving Melbourne at that particular time. And I remember that about halfway, I can't remember exactly where, but about halfway up between Melbourne and Albury, we had to stop for a comfort break and it was pitch black and he indicated that he you know he needed a comfort break so we stopped and we let him out of the car and, and, and I suspect that he was very very apprehensive about getting out of that car and I don't know what was going through his mind one can only presume what might have been going through his mind but he was obviously very very apprehensive we arrived back at uh, Sydney Police Centre um, I think from memory it was round about one o'clock in the afternoon, one or two o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, he was charged then with murder at the Sydney Police Centre and uh, was placed in the cells there where he stayed for a couple of days. Lou is remanded to appear for committal proceedings on September the 30th. Meanwhile, the second suspect, the unidentified man seen meeting with Lou, has flown out of Australia, presumably to Malaysia. Well, he got out of the country uh, because we hadn't been in a position to identify him at that particular point in time. So he left Australia as, as a free agent. On July the 15th, the fugitive is identified as Philip Lim, a 32-year-old Malaysian. Lim has permanent Australian residency and has been working in a Melbourne restaurant. A warrant is issued for his arrest. Following the arrest of uh, Chen Seng Lu, uh, the identity of the second person was established. However, we had missed him by approximately 24 hours before we actually did have his name. And uh, he had arrived in Malaysia. We immediately contacted the Royal Malaysia Police and attempts were set in place from that moment to try and locate and apprehend Lim. 
Superintendent Takbir Nazir Mode of the Royal Malaysian Police Force is already aware of the case. Well, uh, as far as the, that case is concerned, I first read about the incident in the newspaper. And then uh, as soon as uh, that happened, we had some uh, communication or some request made by the New South Wales Police to the Royal Malaysian Police for assistance to try to locate a personality uh, whom they believe was squandered from Australia and may have uh, returned to Malaysia. He, will, he is said to be a Malaysian. Task Force Oak detectives are dispatched to Kuala Lumpur to join local police in tracking Lim down. Upon our arrival in uh, Kuala Lumpur, uh, we had a meeting uh, with the Commissioner of uh, the Royal Malaysia Police, where the resources of the entire police force were uh, placed at our disposal. And um, all I can say is that that was the credence and the importance that the police in Malaysia and the Malaysian government placed on this investigation. I think it will be our duty to try, as a policeman, to try to apprehend and uh, indicate or to show to, the, to, to Australia that we will give whatever necessary cooperation needed in uh, trying to combat any form of crime or the in, any international crime that may, ha may happen, be it a Malaysian or Australia, it doesn't matter. A crime is a crime. It can happen anywhere and we'll be there to basically cooperate with any country for that matter to try to apprehend them. Malaysians share the outrage that Australians feel over the needless death of a great man. In fact, many take it personally. Because it was Dr Chang, uh, Dr Chang being such a prominent surgeon and very well known, but I think it also had a lot to do with the offenders, or at that stage, the alleged offenders, being Malaysian and the shame that it brought uh, to Malaysia. Uh, that was something that came over very clear to us whilst we were working in Malaysia. You know, it reflects on the country slightly. In, in a small way, it will reflect uh, to the country of origin where the, uh, the criminal comes from. But it is so unfortunate that he, uh, he is a Malaysian. Detective Sergeant O'Toole and Detective Senior Constable Paul Jacob spend seven weeks in Malaysia, but they come home empty-handed. Uh, we return to Australia quite reluctantly but we knew that the investigation was in very good hands. Uh, we knew how the police were uh, acting over there. Uh, they were very, very professional in what they did. And we were very, very confident that we would get a result. And we were very confident that that person was still in Malaysia. But now the Melbourne team is on the trail of a third man. And a series of raids is carried out at several addresses in and around Melbourne and a number of people were brought to the CLV and interviewed uh, uh, and amongst those was uh, Stanley Young uh, and uh, other parties and uh, from that we were able to uh, gather information which started to put together the picture so far as what had uh, taken place. A Toyota sedan is found that matches the description of the vehicle that collided with Dr Chang's car. It is owned by Stanley Young. This vehicle had damage to it, which was consistent to, the, uh, to having collided with the Dr. Chang's vehicle, although it uh, had uh, personalised plates on it, uh, and it was subsequently established that um, at the time of the, uh, the actual offence that there were uh, stolen plates on the vehicle, which were, as we understand, discarded at uh, Crow's Nest. But uh, we took possession of this vehicle and checks were made uh, through various indices and there was a parking ticket located uh, in one of the premises down there along with uh, other items including a, uh, some 32 caliber cartridges. The parking ticket has been issued in Sydney shortly before the murder. Damage to the car dovetails exactly with the damage to Dr Chang's car. Police also discover that it's the second murder suspect, Philip Lim, who drove the Toyota to Sydney. He was booked for speeding on the way. This is crucial evidence. It places Lim, the car, and almost certainly the car's owner, Stanley Young, in Sydney, on or about the time of the murder. It became uh, apparent that Ng had been with uh, the other two at some stage, uh, although not at the time of the uh, of the actual offence, but uh, had been uh, uh, present 
with them when they were uh, preparing to carry out this robbery. And in fact, he was interviewed subsequently, interviewed and, uh, and made admissions to that effect. Stanley Young is given immunity from prosecution after he agrees to become a Crown witness. His inside knowledge of the conspiracy that led to Dr Chang's death will prove to be critical. As it turned out, it proved to be uh, pretty close to the truth. And it simply was that these people had come to Australia uh, with the specific purpose of making some money by holding somebody to ransom, a prominent person to ransom, making some money and returning to Malaysia. It was really a get-rich-quick scheme and they didn't think of the consequences that it would have for all these people. In November, four months after Dr Chang's murder, the final piece of the puzzle falls into place. Philip Lim, the man suspected of murdering Dr Chang, along with Chu Seng Lu, is finally tracked down and arrested in Malaysia. The arrest was made uh, by the Malaysian police after lengthy and protracted uh, surveillance operations. A number of his associates that, uh, had been placed under surveillance and a number of premises where he was known to frequent were also placed under surveillance by the Malaysia police. Police have identified credit card transactions made by Lim at this shopping mall, proving that he's still in Malaysia. But it's surveillance of Lim's girlfriend, Kitty Yao Kit Lai, an exotic dancer, that finally leads police to the suspect. You know, we were basically going all out for her because it was a bit impossible to locate uh, the suspect without going through her because we have tried raiding s several places here and uh, he, he was nowhere to be seen. And we knew he was somewhere in KL, he was moving north and south of Kuala Lumpur, but uh, she was the, the, the most important contact point for us to basically do surveillance on. Upon learning that Lim is travelling to Kuala Lumpur by bus and Kitty's to meet him there, police rush to the bus terminal. We have about five takeout team there. We had the whole area covered. There was no way for him to get out of the area. We have got a surveillance team all there. And then the assault team is already there in case of any uh, form of, uh, you know, in case he comes up with any weapon. We are not sure at that point of time. But uh, basically, we surprised him and there was no way that he could have escaped. Superintendent Takbeer calls Dennis O'Toole in Sydney to tell him that Lim has been apprehended. I made a personal call to Dennis that night, it's about three, I get about three, four in the morning to just relate to him the good news about the arrest. And it was, very, in fact, Evelyn, the wife, answered the phone. I was surprised that, you know, she was quite uh, relaxed at that point of time, at that hour to be, uh, you know, to, be, to, to, to receive the call. And then he was quite elated about the arrest. And then we were hoping that they could come and they came quite uh, fast over to Kuala Lumpur. Back in Kuala Lumpur, and armed with an extradition warrant and a brief of evidence, Dennis O'Toole tours the bus terminal where Lim has been captured. Yes, this was the culmination of a seven-week police operation when Lim's girlfriend, who had been under surveillance by the police surveillance unit, came to the telephone, reached the telephone here, and as she reached for the phone, the five police surveillance units bounced and arrested both Lim and his girlfriend at this location. For Philip Lim, being arrested in Kuala Lumpur means being locked up in a hellish place, hundreds of years old and in an advanced state of decay. It's the same place that Australians Barlow and Chambers were hanged after being found guilty of drug smuggling in 1986. This is the well-known Pudu prison in Malaysia. It's where Philip Lim was brought shortly after his arrest and it's where he was held and interviewed and where he made his admissions into the murder of Dr Victor Chang. It's been a massive joint effort by the men of Task Force Oak and the Royal Malaysian Police. Now that Lim's in custody, there's relief all around. The operation conducted throughout Malaysia by the Royal Malaysian Police was a, was a very large-scale operation, an enormous operation. Uh, a lot of effort, a lot of resources went into it. And uh, at the end of the day, it was just an enormous relief for everybody concerned that it had been successful and the person responsible had been apprehended. Philip Lim is brought back to Australia to stand trial along with Chu Seng Lu 
for the murder of Dr. Victor Chang. But before the trials begin, the gunman, Lou, will spring another surprise. Chiu Seng Lu and Philip Lim are to stand trial for the murder of Dr. Victor Chang. Police apply to have them tried jointly. Dennis O'Toole prepares the police case against Lim, while Ron Smith prepares the case against Lu. But Lu springs a surprise. After initially indicating he will plead not guilty, he changes his mind. But as for actually admitting that he was the man who shot Dr. Chang, he's less forthcoming. And even then, he'd never made a a formal uh, interview saying, yes, I, I actually shoot him. It was from his plea of guilty and the evidence that we had at hand, the evidence of Lim and the descriptions of the parties seen at the scene sort of thing that uh, we were fairly convinced that he uh, was the offender. Philip Lim stands trial. Mark Tedeschi QC is the Crown Prosecutor. As he outlines his case, an extraordinary, tragic and at times bizarre story unfolds of an amateurish extortion scheme that has spiralled out of control. Lou, Lim and Stanley Young have driven from Melbourne to carry out a sinister and improbable plan to kidnap Victor Chang and hold him to ransom. Lou and Lim have connections with triad gangs in Malaysia and have run up large gambling debts. They were hoping to pay off those debts with money extorted from Dr. Chang. The three men holed up in the inner suburb of Surrey Hills for nine days before moving to Campsie, 12 kilometres further west. They then moved to nearby Summer Hill. All the while, they were closely observing Dr. Chang's movements and planning their crime. Amazingly, the conspirators made no less than three attempts to carry out their bizarre plot. On June the 26th, eight days before the murder, they went to Dr. Chang's home, planning to kidnap him and his family. But they saw another car in the driveway, and assuming he had visitors, they fled the scene. The following day, they tried again. Some days prior to the murder of Dr. Chang, the two offenders that were responsible for his death and a third person had gone to Dr. Chang's house. They'd sat off the house and they'd actually followed him from his house as he travelled into St Vincent's Hospital. However, they didn't carry out the kidnap attempt, as that, that's exactly what it was at that time, as the driver of the vehicle became very nervous and there was a second person in the vehicle. Uh, so the driver himself decided to pull out of that attempt and as a result of his actions he was left out of the enterprise as it were and the other two decided that they would continue without him. After a heated argument Stanley Young flew back to Melbourne but Lou and Lim decided to go ahead with their scheme unable to grasp the fact that their chances of success were virtually zero. When the people responsible for this outrage, as it were, were interviewed. It, we were quite amazed to think that they were actually confident that they could carry out such an operation. And the operation basically was that they intended to stop Dr. Chang on his way to work by creating a road accident, getting him off the road, giving themselves the opportunity to talk to him, putting to him that they were going to kidnap him, that they wanted the sum of $10 million. That was the figure that was agreed upon by these people. And if he didn't agree to do that, that they would go back to the house where they would proceed to hang his children one by one. So the whole sc scheme itself, you could never in a million years say that it was very professional. Uh, it was quite an amateurish, botched job, uh, which ended in a terrible tragedy. And so, with an air of grim inevitability, the third and ultimately fatal attempt to kidnap Dr. Chang begins on the morning of July the 4th. The staged accident, the threats and the demands for money, and the terrible irony that Dr. Chang is on a life-saving mission at the time. 
So there was actually someone waiting at St Vincent's Hospital uh, for Dr Chang where an operation would be performed. And he never got there. Because two fellows decided to extort money from him and then kill him. And he never got there. And we think that what's happened at the, the crime scene is that Dr Chang has resisted their attempts at this extortion to get money out of him. And there was some indication that they, they wanted to take him to his home. And he knew that his wife and his daughters were at home on that particular morning. And there's no way in the world that Dr Chang was going to allow these two offenders to go to his home. Dr Chang knew that his wife and children may be in jeopardy if the criminals were to get into his home. He courageously stood his ground. And he's fought them. To some extent, he stood his ground. And the fact that he stood his ground was that these two killers um, obviously became perturbed that they weren't getting their way. Uh, they weren't achieving what they wanted, which was extortion. They wanted money. It was murder for money. And so they simply, one of the offenders, which was Lou, subsequently pulled out a 32 pistol, placed it at Dr Cheng's uh, head on his cheek and pulled the trigger and shot him in the head. He fell to the ground and then our witnesses tell us that uh, Lou then bent over Dr Cheng's body, placed the pistol beside his head and pulled the trigger a second time. And he was shot twice and he died instantly. An absolute tragedy. The, uh, the first shot uh, that was fired by Chen Ching Lu uh, struck Dr. Chang in the cheek and the bullet travelled under the skin and exited just behind the right ear. Uh, did not fracture the skull, didn't damage his, his skull in any way and uh, basically it caused him to be knocked out. There was no other evidence that would suggest that he would have had any ill effects whatsoever from that shot. Unfortunately, uh, he fell to the roadway and whilst lying on the roadway, Lou fired a second shot uh, into Dr Chang and that was the fatal shot. Uh, the first shot, no damage, uh, he would have literally come to and got up and walked away and uh, that was the evidence uh, from the government pathologist. Philip Lim is found guilty of the murder of Dr. Victor Chang and is sentenced to 22 years in prison. Chu Seng Lu has already pleaded guilty and avoided trial. His sentence is 24 years. The brutal, senseless murder of Dr. Victor Chang is a tragedy beyond comprehension, but his memory lives on in the best possible way. On November the 23rd, 1993, the Victor Chang Cardiac Research Institute is opened after more than $8 million is donated by the federal government, prominent business people, and the general public. Long after the tragic events that ended his life fade from memory, the name of Dr. Victor Chang will live on. This quiet, charming man, the King of Hearts, is owed a huge debt, and his memory will not easily be forgotten. For the men of Task Force Oak, it's been an outstanding investigation with justice duly done. But they're also left with a clear sense of what a tragedy it's been to lose a man like Victor Chang. This tragedy happened. We can't get around that. But the way that the actual investigation uh, was carried out, uh, I believe, was, it was an outstanding investigation by all the people involved in that. And, uh, and I have nothing but the utmost respect for, firstly, the Victorian police and the Royal Malaysian police in the way that they place their resources at our disposal, the very professional manner in which they carried out all their duties. I mean, the, the, the community, for, for months and months, were all asking the question, why? Why murder Dr Chang? I mean, what a tremendous loss to the community. And, um, and I suppose the investigators went through this period, each of us, we couldn't come to grips with the why. I mean, in terms of the factual legality of the why, we had established that the motive was greed and it was extortion and it was a premeditated uh, and he was actually killed. But when we look back on it now, and I suppose even today, uh, looking back on it, we are still absolutely 
uh, amazed that this type of occurrence could have occurred, even today, in today's situation, when you look back on it now. It's even, it's still hard to come to grips with why was Dr Chang murdered. Dr Victor Chang will always be remembered as a man who cherished life. In one of his rare public interviews, Dr Chang gave an insight into the reasons why he dedicated his life to the saving of others. And in doing so, perhaps tragically, he reflected on his own vulnerability. Life is not permanent for them, nor is it permanent for you and I. It's early morning, three days after Christmas of 1991, and a local resident sets off on his bicycle for a training ride around the Sydney suburb of Arncliffe. As he pedals through the empty streets of a light industrial area, the cyclist notices a large bundle wrapped in plastic bags dumped in overgrown grass by the side of the road. A closer inspection reveals a foul odour and a gruesome sight. Through a small tear in the plastic bag, the cyclist sees what looks like a human jaw. At first glance, it looks like an open and shut murder case. A beautiful young woman is found battered to death, her body dumped like a piece of rubbish beside a Sydney roadway. There are a number of fingerprints that the killer has kindly left behind, and it seems all the police need to do is simply identify the prints and the victim. That should be easy enough, or so they think. Superintendent Mick Platecki, then a detective sergeant with the Southern Region Homicide Squad, is on duty that day. It was a Saturday morning, I just arrived at the office, made a coffee, and then I received a call from the Cogra police about a body found here in Guess Avenue, Arncliffe. Uh, we arrived at the scene a relatively short time later, myself and a deceased colleague now, Detective Senior Sergeant uh, John Hambridge, and uh, the scene had been well preserved. It was a young girl, she was wrapped in black and orange plastic bags. Uh, the head was facing towards the overpass, the legs were curled underneath the body and uh, her back was arched with her arms by her side. Uh, the forearm of the uh, right arm was across the body slightly. She was about 14 to uh, 20 years old. Uh, the thing that struck me was that this was a young girl, obviously in the prime of her life. It was somebody who somebody would miss. Uh, she was not the type of person that you would expect would be, you would have difficulties in identifying. Um, it struck me that uh, the injuries suggested that she had been involved in a fairly violent altercation, possibly uh, uh, grabbed from behind, struck, and then uh, ligature applied to her throat. Other items there that might suggest identity for this girl were fairly limited. She had a wristwatch on and a wedding band, uh, albeit her age did not suggest that she might have been a married girl. On looking at the body, we were confident that once we identified the girl, that would lead us on our first investigative path to the killer. <coughs> Unfortunately, rain the previous night has washed away potentially valuable forensic evidence. When the plastic bags are open, the fact that she's dressed quite provocatively is immediately apparent. Investigators find obvious signs of decomposition, but despite this, it's clear that the victim had been a very attractive young woman. The severe injuries indicate the ferocious nature of the attack. Police find the murder victim is olive-skinned and is scantily dressed in a white halter top with a black and white checked pair of shorts and pink socks on her feet. Police also find something stuffed down the victim's throat, something that looks like a newspaper. They decide not to remove it there, but wait until the post-mortem so it can be retrieved intact. Platecki organizes an extensive search and canvas of the immediate area for a clue as to the victim's identity or any potential witnesses, but nothing. It's also obvious to police that the body of the young woman has been driven here and dumped. She's been murdered somewhere else. This is the secondary crime scene. Police are still confident of solving the case quickly, 
government forensic pathologist Dr. Joe DeFlu attends the crime scene and later conducts the post-mortem. She had a number of head injuries and very importantly she had a piece of newspaper in her mouth. Um, I assumed the newspaper was there as a gag um, at some stage in the proceedings. Um, when I removed the newspaper from the mouth what was obvious was that there was a fingerprint on that newspaper. This obviously was crucial evidence. Um, the fingerprint either had to belong to the assailant or to the deceased. It was easy enough to fingerprint the deceased. If it didn't belong to her, then it had to belong to the assailant. What police do know about the victim is that she's aged between 16 and 25. There are no signs of sexual assault. She's been strangled and something has been stuffed down her throat. Additionally, grains of sand and several dog hairs were found on the body and were found to belong to a German shepherd. The material in the throat turned out to be a Sydney Morning Herald newspaper, a broadsheet, uh, quite substantially compressed and uh, stuffed down the es esophagus. Uh, from memory, it was dated the 10th of December, uh, which, again, we thought may have been a clue as to the approximate time of death. The newspaper is removed from the victim's throat and sent to Detective Sergeant Barry Fay from the fingerprint section. And during that process we spotted a group of three fingerprints, or partial fingerprints to be more exact. They appeared to be in blood, and in fact as it turned out they were in blood, and the victim's blood at that. I became excited because we are in a new era at this time. A computerisation of fingerprints uh, has, has just come to a fore. It was a few years after we had a huge database of criminals. Here was a chance of, of doing something that would be absolutely magic, that couldn't have been done in the last hundred years. Identifying a fingerprint from a murder victim before we even knew who the victim was, in, in, within minutes. But it didn't eventuate. And there was a reason for it. Well, we didn't know it at the time. We couldn't identify the girl's fingerprints either, but she wasn't on record. But the killer was on record, only we missed it. The computer missed it, I should say. The fingerprints definitely belong to the killer, a left-hander, but who is he? Surely identifying the victim will answer that. Police call in the media's support. Fairly definite uh, black uh, stripe that goes down them. They dress up a dummy in the victim's clothes and display it in the area appealing to anyone recognising the young woman to come forward. We were surprised after a couple of, uh, well, after uh, 24 hours when we didn't have an identification. We were still at this point working through canvassing and working through uh, searches of the area for handbags or other items that might have been disposed of by the, uh, the person who dumped the body, but uh, we weren't having any success. What should be the most basic of investigations is now becoming very problematic, despite the calling card the killer has left. Without identifying the fingerprints or the victim, detectives face a daunting challenge to a case that will soon be dubbed the Jane Doe murder. Homicide detectives are baffled by the discovery of the battered body of a young woman found wrapped in plastic bags and dumped on the side of a Sydney street. They're having enormous trouble identifying the victim and can't come up with an identity for the killer who's left his bloodied fingerprints on a newspaper stuffed down the victim's throat. What should have been an open and shut case is now looking very shaky indeed. But detectives are determined to plug on, knowing that identifying the woman called Jane Doe, is crucial. Fiona Martin has recently joined the Homicide Squad and her first assignment is to the Jane Doe murder investigation team. We had received information that um, the girl uh, was a prostitute up at King's Cross. So we, in, in the course of our duties, we went up and we spoke to a number of other prostitutes. We took the photo of the deceased in an effort to identify her. Um, but it was, it was all coming up, at that stage it was all coming up um, fairly negative. We didn't have any strong lead as to who the person was. 
Platecki refuses to let up in his efforts to identify Jane Doe as she lies refrigerated at the city morgue. Desperately seeking a breakthrough in the case, police distribute photos of her extensive dental work nationwide. At the same time that we did this, we also actually did a number of inquiries into the clothing that she was wearing. We found that the top belonged was a brand by the name of Riff Raff, uh, and uh, we actually managed to trace the shorts involved in this case. There were only 18 pairs made, and in fact uh, they were prototypes, uh, and we were able to track down all but two pair, uh, two owners, and unfortunately the, the victim in this case had been somebody who had paid cash and was not able to be traced. Um, we did an examination of the Seiko watch. Uh, we had hoped early in the piece there might have been a fingerprint or some item on the watch that might have been of value. Again, that was a negative result. But we actually went to the manufacturers and got a list of outlets for this watch and how many had been sold. And we found that they had not been sold in Australia but rather were an overseas brand. And that only 600 of those watches had in fact been sold in this country. We would be asking the public, look at the hairstyles by all means, but look at the face in its totality. Frustrated by the lack of progress, Platecki again turns to the media, releasing digitally enhanced images of Jane Doe, whose face has been cleaned up by a makeup artist. Despite an enormous public response, the further media attention provides nothing of value. It's now almost four months since Jane Doe was murdered, and Platecki is under pressure to scale down the investigation. He decides to give the media one last crack and provides an enhanced computer image of Jane Doe to a national women's magazine. We actually did a, a, a piece where I suppose the news item was me. It was talking about the frustration of, of how we were trying to uh, try and uh, track this girl's identity so we could get the killer. Uh, we released a whole series of photos, uh, including uh, stuff we hadn't done previously. We had artist sketches of the deceased as she may have been in life. We had uh, the original morgue photos, um, although somewhat cleaned up as well as the enhancements. And uh, we hoped that that would actually start to trigger a response. And indeed, uh, the breakthrough came shortly after that. A King's Cross prostitute called Lara reads the magazine article and she's stunned. The photo looks very much like a friend of hers who she hasn't seen for several months. Lara doesn't trust the police, but eventually she agrees to meet with a reporter. Little does she know that she's actually meeting Fiona Martin from the New South Wales Police Service. We met her at Newtown. She said that the victim, or who she believed was the victim, was a prostitute working at King's Cross um, as a dancer and also as a prostitute. She went by the name of Linda. This woman also had a photograph of the victim and it did look very similar to um, the deceased person that we had. So it was, it was very positive information and it was very good information. Lara finally agrees to talk to police about her suspicions and convinces them that Jane Doe is in fact her friend and colleague Vivian Ruiz. Lara describes a birthmark on the back of Ruiz's hand as well as the jewellery and the watch she was wearing. The reason that she had not realised earlier that Ruiz was the, the victim was twofold. Firstly, the, uh, the newspaper stories that, uh, had, been, had come out in isolation and the photos individually had not looked like her friend. And when she'd seen the comp compilation of photographs in the woman's magazine, she suddenly realised that there was a, a, a resemblance. And uh, the second thing was that the, the story in the woman's magazine had actually made it, had clicked on the grounds that we'd mentioned the fact that the hair of the victim had been dyed. We weren't sure of the original hair colour. So that made us start to think twice about, uh, about her colleague. Uh, and um, uh, I, I think the, uh, the uh, recognition on the, the fact that uh, when we had these um, photographs taken, uh, we had this variety of photographs. We had eyes open, mouths open, we showed her teeth in some. Uh, and she was able to actually just piece together this, pic this picture of a friend in, a f in her head and marry it into the, uh, to the, to the photographs we presented. Vivian's friends are not concerned that they haven't seen her for some time. After all, she and her boyfriend, Richard White, are planning a trip to Europe together. The mystery deepens when White tells them their relationship's over and Vivian has left for Europe alone. Police are now certain the body in the bag is 22-year-old Vivian Linda Ruiz. They suspect Richard White might have killed her. His explanation surrounding her disappearance just doesn't add up. 
The people that we spoke with who knew Vivian spoke about Richard White being her boyfriend at the time and Richard White, um, the, these friends had seen Richard being quite violent towards her. Where were you last night? Why do you care? Huh? Um, she apparently was, had a bit of a smart mouth and he would, he would be violent towards her, he'd hit her. We were aware from a number of the people that we were put in touch with that uh, White was a petty criminal who had some uh, petty drug dealing. Uh, he was known to be taking steroids and amphetamine and uh, he had a violent and abusive nature. Uh, and there were several witnesses that indicated that um, uh, in, uh, their, through their knowledge of him that uh, they considered him to be somebody whom they were scared of. Armed with the identities of the victim and her boyfriend, police check the criminal and fingerprint records of Ruiz and White. There's nothing on Vivian Ruiz, but Richard White is on record for several minor offences and in fact has been fingerprinted in the past. Detectives discover that Ruiz's parents are divorced and are both living in different European countries. Police locate Vivian Ruiz's uncle living on the Gold Coast. Detective Martin is dispatched to interview him as they still need to positively identify the murder victim. Whilst we were in Queensland, we also made inquiries with a number of dentists because the deceased had had extensive dental work. And so we made inquiries with these dentists and we were able to locate a dentist who had in fact treated Vivian Ruiz and he had uh, dental x-rays on his file which he gave to us. Now those dental x-rays were very important in the identification of the deceased. Now that they have a positive identification of Vivian Ruiz, police are certain the fingerprints on the newspapers will belong to Richard White. But elation soon turns to despair when fingerprint experts inform them the prints don't match. We were sure that it was Richard White um, because, because of his previous, previous violent behaviour towards her, um, also because he'd taken off overseas um, shortly after the murder. Um, and, and so we, were, we suspected him, he was a good suspect. So everyone was, everyone was extremely disappointed um, and, and we almost couldn't believe that it was not the same fellow. Senior Sergeant Barry Fay wasn't convinced either and re-examines the fingerprint comparisons. It's then he realises what's gone wrong. There is the point of identity. The prints on the newspaper are in fact a mirror image of whites, a rarity known as tonal reverse. In this case, the killer, we uh, theorised, had hit the victim on the right side because he was left-handed. And then he tries to strangle her before he used the ligature with his own hands. But his hands are slipping and sliding in her blood. Then in a desperate attempt, he uses the ligature and ties it around the neck about three times. She still appears to be breathing and in, and in desperation, he looks for some other weapon and spots the Sydney Morning Herald. So he grabs that with his, his left hand because that's his strongest hand. And as he does so, he wipes the, the ridges, the tops of the ridges like the corrugations on an iron roof, he wipes the top of those ridges, but the valleys in between are still moist. Then he pushes it into her throat, and in doing so, he uses his most powerful hand, and the best fingerprint is the highest finger, and the tips of the fingers is then transferring that fine bloodline in the valleys to the paper. The paper then closes around the fingerprint, preserving it from saliva and other things. And there it is, waiting to be found. The fact that the prints on the newspaper were made from blood in the valleys of the fingerprints, rather than the ridges or tips, means the prints on the newspaper are actually like a photo negative. So Sergeant Fay reverses a photo of the prints and gets a perfect match. We did have some obstacles to overcome at that point, though. Um, we couldn't use the charge print from his, his uh, traffic matter uh, to identify him. So we needed to go and find another source of uh, a fingerprint. We knew that he was out of the country. And at that stage, uh, we didn't know where he was. 
we managed to track down the fact that he and the deceased had lived in a flat in Victoria Street, King's Cross. We tracked down the real estate and what we did was we got hold of the lease agreement. This actually gave us two sets of prints. It gave us the, the deceased prints and Richard White's prints. So it confirmed again another source of confirmation on her identity and it also gave us a set of comparison prints that we knew were Richard White's that we could use in court without having to use charge sheet prints. So that actually gave us a, an extra bow in the, in the arrow, if you like, for the, for the prosecution. The case against Richard White is now compelling and there's enough evidence to arrest him for the murder of Vivian Ruiz. There's just one problem. Richard White can't be found. He's flown the coop. It's taken four months for homicide detectives to identify a pretty young woman found bashed to death, wrapped in plastic bags and dumped on a Sydney roadside as prostitute Vivian Ruiz. They've also identified her former boyfriend, petty criminal Richard White, as the prime suspect after matching his bloodied fingerprints to those found on newspaper stuffed down Ruiz's throat. The only problem is, they can't find their prime suspect. Police establish that White, using a British passport, has left Australia shortly after Ruiz's murder. And they track his movements down to the Philippines, where the trail fades. Plateki comes up with a plan to determine White's whereabouts, and it works. We were aware that he had family residing in Bexley, um, and uh, we had that place under surveillance. Uh, indeed, um, to determine uh, the whereabouts of White, uh, because we had heard through some of the witnesses that he'd gone overseas, uh, I actually had one of our trusted highway patrol uh, staff attend uh, his parents' address with a, um, a fabricated uh, traffic accident inquiry. And uh, it, the, the, the sergeant involved was given a very specific set of instructions about what it was needed. Uh, he had to establish where White was. Uh, he had to establish whether there was a dog in the premises and uh, also what vehicles White may or may not have had. The sergeant was very, very good. He came back with uh, all, that, all those results. We, we, we knew there was a dog in the premises, so we had something to link the dog hair in. Um, he had managed to obtain uh, a location in uh, England, in uh, uh, Newcastle, where uh, White was. And uh, he had also determined that there was a van at the premises which had been White's work van. So we were fairly confident at that stage we had some evidence we could collect from that location. Scotland Yard Detective Sergeant Les Bone is assigned the task of tracking down White in England. All Bone has to go on is a list of telephone numbers that have been traced back to England from the home of Richard White's parents. Most come from phone booths in London, but one provides Bone with a vital clue. From a telephone number that was reverse call charge from Newcastle to the parents' address. Um, we, uh, I searched that number and got an address in a, an area called Walker, which is part of Newcastle on Tyne. Sergeant Bone is aware that White enjoys pubs and nightclubs, and so armed with photos of their quarry, Bone and his team visit night spots around Newcastle to see if any staff can identify him. A barmaid does just that, confirming that White is indeed in Newcastle and staying with his relatives. So I decided that um, I'd get a female to ring the address and ask for Richard. I got this husky voiced uh, female detective from Newcastle to ring up and ask for Richard. And lo and behold, he answered the phone. We were outside the address at the time. As soon as she said, he's there, we were in through the front door. And there he was in the living room with the telephone in his hand. I told him who I was. I told him he was being arrested on a warrant that had been granted by Bow Street's Magistrates Court at the request of the Government of Australia for the murder of Vivian Ruiz. Detective Sergeant Bone immediately calls his counterpart in Australia to tell him they have White in custody. Before White can alert his parents, Sergeant Platecki conducts a simultaneous raid on the family home in Sydney. 
uh, he had a workshop down underneath the house and what we found was that uh, there's a void area uh, further up under the house from the workshop. Uh, that had been covered in lime, but uh, the sandy soil there suggested it to us that this might have been the source of the sand on the body. We took some um, items from the house that we thought might have been connected to the crime scene. We found some uh, nylon rope that we thought might have been connected. Probably the, 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 the most important items were hair from the family dog, which in turn actually was matched that, of the, that we found on the body. And um, the big prize was actually his, his vehicle. He had a, a Toyota high ace van that he used for his furniture polish, polishing business. Uh, the van had a, a carpet square in the back of it. And the carpet square was stained. Uh, we took the whole square as, as the van. The transmission tunnel had what appeared to be a smear of blood on it. And uh, again, the whole van was taken for forensic examination, but uh, those items, it transpired, we did uh, what we call polymer chain testing, as it was in those days before DNA, on the blood smear, and we found that it matched with one chance in 16, Mr. Ruiz's blood. And we found that the, the uh, carpet square, while it had a stain on it, and we could say that it was some form of body fluid, we were unable to classify it any further because uh, clearly at some point white had poured um, thinners and other chemicals onto that stain in, obviously in an attempt to disguise it. But uh, these two items actually proved crucial to actually um, establishing that this was the vehicle that had conveyed the body to that dump site. Back in the United Kingdom, a handcuffed white is being flown from Manchester to London to be charged with murder. He becomes talkative on the flight. Then he said, I don't want to go back to Australia. She told me Christmas Eve that she was a prostitute. I just thought she was a dancer. She was coming around to my parents' place for Christmas. I felt so stupid. We had a fight. It's not as bad as the same. Sydney lawyer Lee Johnston flies to London to represent White and oppose extradition. White eventually changes his mind and agrees to return to Australia to face the charge of murder. We searched his luggage as a matter of air aircraft security and in that luggage we found some notes which were fairly incriminating. And I remember one of the, one of the notes that he had made was, convince yourself you're innocent. By those notes he was preparing himself for a, an interview with the police that um, he was making a, a case for himself. When we um, took him to London. I took his, his luggage to the forensic laboratory and we searched his luggage for uh, possible blood stains on clothing or anything else that might be of interest to the Australian police. In that luggage I found a piece of cord knotted at each end. It was 38 inches long and we believed it was a possible ligature. That was bagged up in an exhibits bag and given to the police when they arrived from New South Wales. On arrival in Australia, and still protesting his innocence, Richard White is brought here to the Sydney Police Centre, where he's officially charged with the murder of Vivian Linda Ruiz. When we ultimately went to trial, uh, it took some attempts to actually get him there. Um, we had feedback from various sources in the prison and various items of intelligence that Richard was going to run a defence of diminished responsibility and indeed that certainly appeared to be the case in the lead up. There were several delays and several false starts to the trials. Uh, on one occasion Richard actually kicked out a restraining uh, barrier in the uh, dock area that he was in the, in the court and jumped on the uh, bar room table and started to act like an ape. On another occasion he uh, masturbated uh, and these are all during the, the, the preliminary components to a trial so that we kept finding that we were quickly running out of juries. Uh, there was constant delays. Uh, at the same time, we were aware that whilst he was in prison, Richard was uh, um, acting in a very erratic behaviour. Uh, he was down in the prison hospital most often as not. Uh, apparently, he was caught on several occasions when people were watching eating flies. Uh, just that sort of behaviour that would suggest a mental illness, but um, ultimately, I don't think that was actually the case. White's defence team knows the fingerprint evidence found on the newspaper stuffed down Vivian Ruiz's throat is damning. White's only chance is for his defence team 
to cast doubt in the minds of the jurors to refute the otherwise overwhelming evidence. Barry Fay was in the witness box and I can remember the, he had just presented evidence on the newspaper and this fingerprint in uh, what we said was blood. And I can recall the defence team getting up and objecting and saying, well, you can't say it's blood. Uh, it could be a protein matter of any kind. And Barry agreed, well, yes, we, we can't say it's blood because we, we haven't had it tested, we didn't want to damage the print. Uh, so you, we'd have to concede it's a protein material of some sort. Uh, the defence then put the hypothesis that he was reading the newspaper and simply had a, you know, some pie sauce or some tomato sauce on his hand and touched the newspaper. We argued that, that uh, in our belief, it, it was possible, of course, but uh, we didn't believe it was anything but blood. And then Mick Pateki thought of a brilliant idea and he rang the Sydney Morning Herald and a copy of that paper was sent over to the court and it was established that if he was eating a pie when he read the newspaper, he was doing it upside down. That's how the fingerprints formed on the paper. The evidence is overwhelming. The fingerprints, the blood found in White's work van and the crib notes on how to throw police off his scent. Supreme Court Justice Peter Hidden has no hesitation in finding White guilty of the murder of Vivian Ruiz. In sentencing White to 15 years jail with a nine year non-parole period, he says, Clearly, the violence inflicted on the deceased by the prisoner was the result of passion arising in some way from their relationship, although what it was that triggered it remains obscure. But despite White's unwillingness to make any statement at all about the matter, Superintendent Platecki thinks he knows how it all played out. The reality was that I think that he, he killed her during the, the stero a steroid rage. Um, I think ultimately the... Uh, the Newspaper in her throat was the result of the fact that um, bodies actually um, emit a lot of gases. And I think you would have found that the body would have been quite noisy. You'd have found that actually there would have been what he thought would have been moaning. So it may well have been that he stuffed the paper down her throat on the belief that she was still alive and basically was to finish her off. Uh, and he's then probably kept the body at the house in the open area underneath where it was quite aired, which would explain the mummification of the fingers. Placed it in his van and then dumped it down in Guess Avenue at some point later on. And then uh, he's acquired uh, her savings through a savings book, uh, headed overseas, and uh, obviously thought that he'd got away with it. Thanks to the dedication and investigation skill of the homicide team, a cruel, cold-hearted killer has been brought to justice. His victim, 22-year-old Vivian Ruiz, lies in a pauper's grave at Rookwood Cemetery, where she was cremated before just three mourners. No one comes to visit her anymore. Richard White is due for parole this year.